Well, this is your host, Todd Lewis, of the Praise of Folly podcast. Today I'm joined again by Keith Preston. Um, we're here to discuss tonight the uh, relative failure of alternative political views to the current sort of Democrat-Republican control that most people have. Most people in American politics think that well, the only really viable options are Democrats or Republicans. Um, anarchists, libertarians, and, and now the alt-right have at various times attempted to say, hey, look, there's another way to do this. You know, we can, we don't have to be stuck in this, in this race. Now, what's interesting is that they've all been uniformly failures in, in trying to create a new political space. Most people today either don't know who they are, like with Antifa and the alt-right. I mean, Charlottesville really for the first time brought both the alt-right and certain far-left, Antifa, even anarchist ideas to average people. And so I guess why do you think, Keith, that anarchists, libertarians, and the alt-right have thus far been unable to make inroads with the average people? Well, I think you have to break them down on the basis of the individual movements. I, I don't think there's any one explanation that explains collectively why all of these movements have not made any more headway than they have. Um, in the case of the alt-right, I think the main problem there is that they represent ideas that are simply that simply involve swimming against the tides, so to speak. Uh, the prevailing trends in the United States and in most Western nations generally, uh, is, at least for the last half century, if not the last several centuries, has been towards uh, ever greater uh, liberalization or um, uh, more, uh, more leftward-leaning politics generally. And for a movement like the alt-right that embraces uh, you know, racial separatism, racial supremacy, uh, racial white white nationalism, racial identitarianism, uh, for uh, a movement like the alt right that calls into question modern political philosophies like democracy and and liberal republicanism and constitutionalism, uh, particularly in the United States, when the alt right says that the uh, American Revolution was a failure and that America has been a failure and that. Uh, the, uh, it would have been better if the uh, America had remained part of the British Empire, and it would have been better if we still had the monarchies or, or more uh, traditional systems that existed in past centuries. Uh, taking that kind of stance, which is an extremely reactionary stance by contemporary standards, is something that's really just not that sellable, I think, in American politics. Um, now, it is true that we have a lengthy history of racial conflict in the United States, and the alt-right in you know, some of the ideas you find there is one of the later, more recent manifestations of that, uh, just like we see it coming from the other end with Black Lives Matter, with Antifa, and all of these kinds of things. Um, but it's still true that the uh, trend has been towards ever greater liberalization in American society, particularly on race and on a lot of other things as well. And a movement like the alt-right that simply says, no, we reject all that. We want to go back to things as they were in some past times, or we want to reject, we want to reject this dominant uh, liberal, or whatever you want to call it, paradigm when it comes to these kinds of questions. That really is an uphill battle. I mean, it's not surprising that a movement that has ideas like that really is having a, a lot of difficulty in terms of building an audience. In fact, the reason that they are as well known as they are, in spite of the fact that it's such a small movement, is because of the sheer offensiveness of their ideas to so many other people. Uh, increasingly, uh, ideas like uh, racism or sexism or fascism uh, are becoming to contemporary or mainstream society uh, the equivalent of what, say, communism might have been in the 1950s or 1960s. Uh, if you wanted to discredit a political opponent in the 1950s and 1960s, you wanted to label them a communist. Uh, for example, Richard Nixon, when he ran for um, uh, the, the California Senate in the 50s, his uh, opponent was a liberal Democrat, and he was labeling her a communist sympathizer, calling her the pink lady, and things like that. Um, and that's you know what, that was a market for that back in the in, during that time period during the height of the Cold War. Uh, nowadays, the the pendulum has swung a bit, and labeling someone a racist, a fascist, a sexist, a Nazi, uh, that tends to be more where the political epithets are, are moving in terms of trying to discredit discredit political opponents. 
and a movement that comes along and, and embraces some of these labels and says, yeah, we're racist, we're sexist, we're homophobic, we, you know, we think fascism wasn't that bad. That's obviously, um, immediately, on, on one hand, it's going to get to a lot of attention if you take stances like that because it's very transgressive when compared with the mainstream values. But it's also something that's going to make you unpopular in the sense that you're not going to have a whole lot of people that are going to rally behind a, a set of ideas like that. What you are going to find is a lot of people who are attracted to this idea because it is transgressive. Um, so I think that's the problem that all right has. Now, when it comes to anarchists and, and libertarians, um, the first problem that anarchists have is branding. Um, the word anarchy to most people uh, means chaos, it means uh, disorder and things like that. And there's a certain personality type, a certain psychological makeup that is drawn to anarchism for that reason. Uh, there are certain people who are, you know, just like they're drawn to the alt-right because it's transgressive. They're also drawn to anarchism because it's transgressive. Uh, in fact, that's why you see some of the clashes between the alt-right and the and the anarchist and the Antifa and other similar groups is because you have groups of people that are trying to be transgressive and they're trying to be transgressive in their own ways and they end up clashing with each other. Um, you know, they tend to identify each other as, as tribal enemies. Um, but the, the, the label anarchist is always something has, has always been something that has you know only a certain range of appeal. There's just a uh, that's a brand that it doesn't have a market beyond beyond a certain level. Um, in fact, one thing that's been the case is that historically, whenever anarchist influenced ideas have become successful or popular or influential, it's usually involved some process where the ideas were able to expand outside of the actual anarchist milieu. Um, one example is what's going on in some of the Kurdish territories today, where you actually have the Kurdish militias and all of that that are influenced by Murray Bookchin uh, indirectly through, through Alkalon, the, the PKK leader. Um, and that's a situation there where anarchism found its way into a, a contemporary guerrilla you know, arm struggle movement indirectly through largely changing the name and orienting it towards a different uh, towards a different milieu by calling it democratic confederalism rather than anarchism. Uh, another example is the Pirate Party, which has a very anarchistic flavor to it. In some ways, it's kind of like the Yippies and groups like that from the 60s, but then they've positioned themselves as this kind of radical centrist party that is uh, opposed to um, uh, uh, control over the internet and things like that, which is a contemporary issue that's popular. Uh, another example are some of these startup societies and micro nations, you know, Lieberland and intentional communities and all these kinds of things. Uh, not a lot of those groups don't necessarily call themselves anarchists, but they're, they're doing uh, things similar to what anarchists have historically done, like for utopian colonies and things like that. So we see a situation where the, 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 the brand itself has a fairly um, limited range of appeal, although you can take some of the ideas and apply them in a, another context and they will grow and expand a little bit. Um, at the same time, um, I think anarchism has some of the same problems as libertarianism. Um, some years ago, there was a congressman from Arizona, and I can't remember who was, what his name was, um, but he said that uh, one problem libertarians have is that they have a 24 karat gold idea, freedom, and yet they can't give it away. And the question is why? And I think the reason for that is that freedom is not really a primary value for most people. Um, I mean, certainly, uh, first of all, there's different types of freedom. There's different ways in which people define freedom and not everybody defines freedom in the same way. But I think as a general rule, liberty in the way that libertarians define it, that is negative li liberty, freedom from state control, freedom from external control. I think that that's not really a primary value for a lot of people. For, for many people, it's not a value at all. You know, many people prefer other things and think other things are more important, security, order, stability, uh, cohesion, equality, you know, social justice, um, tradition, uh, you know, the in-group in or out-group issues uh, like, you know, nation, race, religion, uh, country, uh, tribe, whatever. Um, so there's a lot of other, a lot of people for whom liberty is not a, a, an essential value. Um, there are other people for whom liberty is a value, but it's only a secondary value. They still think other things are more important. And even among people 
who claim liberty as a primary value, there's still uh, a lot of disagreement over what kinds of liberty are the most important, ought to be emphasized. And that's why we see so many different types of libertarians and anarchists. Um, among the anarchist milieu, for example, you see so many hyphenated forms of anarchists. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of hyphenated forms of anarchists. And I've heard it said that whatever kind of hyphen they have is what they really are, meaning an anarcho communist or really communist, an anarcho capitalist or really capitalist, and an anarcho syndicalist or really syndicalist, and all of that. So that's a problem. Uh, but um, even among narrowing it down a bit, even to just the American style uh, libertarian, free market, limited government, or anarcho capitalist people, even there, there's a lot of disagreement on what's most important. Uh, for example, the uh, the Cato Institute types, the, the main, more mainstream libertarians, uh, you know, they're the, the foundation for economic education. They're more interested in economic growth and development, things like that. That's what they care about. You know, a lot of the liberal libertarians groups, that's kind of what they're oriented towards. Uh, then you have uh, other libertarians who are more conservative, uh, like the paleo libertarians. They'll, they criticize the state because they think the state is unconservative. And it's not that the state is too is, is is too conservative. They think the state actually undermines more conservative values like family, religion, community, or you know middle class lifestyle values or whatever. Um, and then you have left libertarians who are have essentially the same views as as the left or even the far left, uh, but who think for whatever reason that the state is interfering with the advancement of you know anti racism or gay liberation or, or something like that. Um, so when you have uh, and ideas that no one really agree on what they mean. It's hard to have a uh, a movement because a movement has to have some kind of focus. Like for any any successful movement that has ever existed historically and ever really achieved anything, had some basic areas of common agreement that were the focus for a whole lot of people. Um, for example, in the mainstream society, in among the Democrats and Republicans, um, you know, what are the core ideas that motivate all the constituent groups on both sides? You know, there's a lot of differences among different types of Democrats and Republicans, but among Democrats, I would say the main unifying thread is their opposition to the traditional WASP society, that is the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant society that was hegemonic in the United States from say the 19th, I mean, from the 18th century up through maybe the, uh, you know, the 1960s or something like that. Um, you know, so being opposed to the traditional WASP elite of the traditional WASP, dominant WASP middle class culture is really the one thing that I think unifies the left and, and the mainstream left being the Democratic Party. Um, and by extension, I think the main thing that unifies the Republicans or the mainstream right is preserving the position of the of the traditional WASP culture against insurgencies from the other side, from you know minorities or from liberalism or the left or, or environmentalists or gays or, or whatever. So this kind of cultural back and forth is really what drives that. And, and that's really the main thing that mo both groups seem to be focused on. If you, you know, for people who really take voting seriously in elections, um, between the Democrats and Republicans, if you ask them, you know, what issues are important to you? Why do you bother to vote? Usually that's what it comes down to. It usually comes some, down to something to do with this kind of back and forth between the WASP and the anti-WASP. Uh, or, or it's economic self-interest. It's uh, you know, the, well, I don't, I don't want the government to cut out my student loans, or I don't want the government to raise my taxes, or something like that. Um, and the all these other groups, the the libertarians, the anarchists, the alt right, they have never really developed some kind of unifying thread. I think that really inspires people to take action. I, with the alt right, maybe just being transgressive against political correctness. I think maybe. Um, is their unifying thread, oh, but you, you can't really, uh, I don't know that just being against something really makes for a successful movement. You have to have some kind of vision of what it is you want to achieve, and there's certainly no agreement about that among all right types. And I think anarchists and, and libertarians have the same way, I have the same problem. Uh, with, with anarchists, if you spend time around the mainstream left type anarchists, they are purely reactive. I mean, they're against racism or they're against sexism or something like that, but they often have a very limited, uh, very poorly articulated vision of what it is they're for. 
libertarians will say they have this kind of vision of a stateless society or a society with limited government and, and all these kinds of things, but it's not really a vision that that many people really care that much about. It's not something that people uh, think see as really doing something for them personally or the groups, the reference groups that they identify with. It's just too abstract. It just pe appeals to the idea of liberty in the abstract sense, which is something that most people either just don't care about or don't really see it as being of any tangible value to them. So I think that's the they, that's really the problem with all of these movements on the margins is their inability to really um, motivate people to take action on their behalf and move into the mainstream culture. Yeah, I think one thing that's illustrative to look at to see them to ask um, what would need to be done by these politically fringe groups to become successful is to look at the most successful group that ever uh, that was politically fringe, which was Marxism. Oftentimes, the alt-right will even say, you know, we're in the same place today that Marxists were in the 1880s. Um, and the question is, how did the Marxists go from essentially a bunch of fringes and kooks writing, you know, and meeting in secret underground basements, writing these like secret presses, to becoming not only the captains of empires, but, but also infiltrating the academy and becoming department chairs of universities to the point where the Marxists are almost now the new bourgeoisie. And I think, I think part of it is that, well, certainly having a definitive idea of what you're aiming for, an end goal is helpful. Uh, Marxism, Marx and Lenin and, and those likes were notoriously bad in not outlining what the end game would look like only vague platitudes so that that is a problem but i don't think it's an insuperable problem to overcome and the thing that that the marxists had that these groups don't is a sort of sense of organizational unity one of the things that's well known is in the first internationals i mean marx sort of attempted to monopolize the international left you know, he had public breaks with kropotkin and and i think also Proudhon. And the Marxists ended up having a much more concentrated, essentially planned system, whether it was the reformists like Bernstein in Germany or the uh, vanguardists like Lenin in Russia. Either way, though, they had this common uh, drive, almost military organization. Uh, of course, in the case of Lenin, it was a violent organization, whereas in the case of Bernstein and the uh, Fabian Socialist Society in England, it was more of a peaceful democratic attempt to change society and I think you could argue that the more peaceful attempt had longer lasting results um, for the from the Marxist point of view that's important and another thing too that a lot of these groups don't do which the Marxists did do was they actively engaged in issues that matter to actual blue-collar people now there was always these sort of highfalutin Marxist intellectuals and there will always be anarchist libertarian alt-right intellectuals and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But the, the thing is, most people can't relate to that. Most people don't relate to that. And so if you just kind of stick at that level, uh, you're not going to have mass appeal. You're not going to be able to convince blue-collar people, and even white-collar people, who, granted, are more educated uh, than blue-collar people, generally speaking. But still, they have their own worldly affairs to worry about. Whereas the Marxists were very keen in getting involved in labor organization strikes, and lobbying for better working conditions for workers. So people could see tangible results from working with Marxists or working with Marxist allied groups to achieve tangible results for themselves. Now, in the case of uh, vanguardist Marxism, it ultimately was a, a trick where they could then throw you in the gulag once they took power. Whereas in Western, with Western Marxism, it's appeared to be more successful because they haven't had the chance to build up a gulag and throw you in it yet. But I, I think that's that's a key thing that the Marxists understood and helped them transform themselves from these ivory tower intellectuals to people that actually got things done. And in a more broader sense, a lot of these people um, uh, that are anarchist libertarians and alt-right, they, they, they tend to use the ideologies more as a crutch to blame other people for their failings. So right, if you're an unemployed white guy, you blame affirmative action. If you're uh, you know, some high IQ libertarian guy that can't get hired, you, 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 know, you blame the government or something. And if you're an anarchist you know, with all of their constituents, 
whether you're a, a black anarchist or a feminist anarchist, it's the patriarchy or racism that holds you down. And so it's almost like they want somebody else to take action for them to solve the problem. Whereas at least in the early days of Marxism, it was more active, like you would actively do something to, to uh, improve yourself. Or the, the organization would act for your interests. Uh, the anarchists do talk a good talk about direct action, but they very seldom do it. What direct action amounts to today, more or less, is just extended, you know, Woodstocks like it, uh, you know, in New York in 2011. They don't actually do direct action of the kind that, say, was quite common in the 1950s and 60s with uh, civil rights action. I mean, you're not going to see anarchists or libertarians of the alt right, you know, risk getting arrested by sitting in you know, uh, some sort of business or, or blocking traffic like they used to do in the 50s and 60s. So I think a combination of lack of action, they're too platonic, they're not, they're not active enough. Uh, they don't, they have a hard time translating their ideas into ways that just frankly normal people would understand. And in fact, they often engage in radically antisocial and almost in bizarre social activity. Like whether it's Charlottesville in 2017, or whether it's the Berkeley riots, or whether it's um, the uh, 2011 with the Occupy Wall Street, most normal people are just put off by this kind of bizarre transgressiveness. Whether it's you know waving swastikas or pooping on cop cars, most people just are offended at that, and it's just going to turn them off. And I think I think all of those things kind of work together to help marginalize these groups. What are your thoughts on that, Keith? Well, all of the points you raise, I think, are true. Um, and in the case of the Marxists, that is an interesting example because it is, like you said, a, a, a situation where a movement that was very much on the fringes and actually illegal in a lot of places actually became very powerful and, and influential. In the case of the Marxists, I think the reason for their comparative historical success had to do with a lot of things. Um, first of all, uh, one thing about the Marxists is that they were never the mainstream of the labor movement. Uh, they were always on the fringes of the labor movement, as were the anarchists and other similar groups. Uh, the mainstream labor movement was always more comparable to the civil rights movement of the 60s in the sense that it was basically reform oriented. It was basically about getting better working conditions in the here and now and things like that, just like the civil rights movement was about uh, equal opportunity, employment and things of that nature. Um, radicals were always on the fringes in, in the civil rights movement in the 60s, you know, actual black separatists like the Nation of Islam or actual revolutionary Marxists like the Black Panthers were always on the margins. That was not the mainstream of the civil rights movement and the labor movement was the same way. The, uh, the trade unions were always relatively conservative, like the AFL and all of that, and they were more concerned about higher wages and shorter hours and better working conditions. Uh, but what the Marxists were able to do was, on one hand, they were able to find an idea, like you said, that was popular and kind of exploit that idea towards their own ends. Although I would point out that the Marxists were the most successful in countries that did not have a huge working class, that, that were industrialization had barely taken place. That was certainly true with the Leninists. And we could argue that the social democratic strand of Marxism uh, was more successful in the West, uh, where you did have a, a, a large, um, work, you know, like, large working class and industrialized society. Um, although even there, though, um, they, the, the left was successful largely through uh, more reformist measures like social security and things like that, as opposed to uh, you know, uh, revolutionary Marxism. But Marxism, I think, was successful in the sense that uh, it had certain characteristics that um, were unique in a lot of ways. One is that it had th this very elaborate theoretical system. Uh, the fact that Marxism is such an elaborate theoretical system, I think it radically increased its appeal to intellectuals. Uh, most Marxists, or, well, or most people that I have known who were once hardcore Marxists, uh, when I would ask them, well, what, what was the appeal of that to you? They would always say, well, it just seemed like it could explain everything. Um, and I think that that was part of the appeal of Marxism to intellectuals, and it had a, uh, a lot more appeal to intellectuals than other movements did because of that, because of this elaborate the theoretical system. 
Um, now, I, I don't. That doesn't necessarily mean the theoretical system that the Marxists have is true. I, I'm inclined to say that a lot of it has a lot of really interesting insights. Uh, a lot of it is half truths, and a lot of it is ridiculous. But that's you know beside the point. I mean, the fact that people were impressed by this intellectual system and, and took it seriously, I think, is one thing. Uh, another thing that made the Marxists popular, uh, or at least made them successful, is uh, the fact that it did appeal to the intellectuals in the sense that it, it offered the intellectuals uh, a means of upward mobility and a means of power. Uh, if, if you look at Marxist movements historically, what you see is that they very rarely had a huge following among the actual working class, and certainly most Marxists who were well known. None of the historic Marxist revolutionaries or theoreticians really came from the working class. Stalin was the one exception. He was from the peasant class in Georgia, but most Marxist leaders and theoreticians came from the middle class, even the upper middle class, and so they came from relatively privileged backgrounds, and again, what impressed them about Marxism was the theoretical system, not the, you know, not their personal economic conditions in terms of being exploited. It was more a case of where you had a middle class or, or even an upper middle class that was upwardly mobile, and you had an intellectually class intellectual class that found its uh, its political motivations being uh, frustrated by societies where there was a lot of political inertia. Um, and Noam Chomsky actually uh, once remarked that the reason that Leninism was uh, appealing to a lot of intellectuals is that it brought, is that it was a perfect uh, means for intellectuals to achieve political power. Uh, you know, the idea of uh, the vanguard party that, you know, the professional class of revolutionaries, of intellectuals who understood the theory and the program and all that in the way that uneducated workers and peasants can't, and then the, you know, who are going to be the, the elite of the party and, the, and then the, the technocrats that manage the state once the party takes over the state and things like that. But that kind of ideology and strategy and methodology is perfect for intellectuals who seek upward mobility or seek uh, empowerment of their own because it really provides them with the means of doing that. So I think that's one thing that has to be considered when it comes to the Marxists. Um, another issue is Marxism uh, offers a kind of utopian vision. It has this vision where, yes, it's very vague on one hand, but it also promises this future world where uh, social injustice has been eliminated and it has this elaborate theoretical system that purports to predict that this is going to happen. Uh, I think that that was really inspiring to a lot of gung-ho, fanatical uh, Marxists um, during the time of uh, that the Marxist movements were really starting to grow and become influential. Um, Jonathan Bowden, the uh, the late British right wing figure, once gave a lecture um, about Marxist movements, and he said that what you found among them was really interesting because, in terms of the kinds of people you would find in these groups, in these hard left groups, he said on one hand you would find people that were just totally uh, intellectual; they were they were motivated entirely by theory and ideology and things like that. Then you had others that were more like idealists or dreamers, you know, the types of people who think there ought to be more love in the world and things like that. And then you had almost criminal types, almost gangster types that were there because they saw this as a means to power. Um, and, and that's in fact, you know, explains a lot about why Marxist parties and regimes always functioned to a large degree like mafia organizations and mafia states because of that, because of its appeal to that kind of personality. Um, so that I, all of those things, I think, explain the historic uh, success or appeal of Marxism. Um, the movements that we're talking about, the alt-right, the libertarians, the, the left anarchists, I think um, have certain limitations that the Marxists didn't, because in the case of the libertarians and anarchists, a movement that is purporting to abolish the state as an objective is not going to be appealing to people who want to achieve state power for themselves, or who see uh, this, uh, who want to belong to a movement that they think is going to enhance their own personal upward mobility in terms of status and things of that nature. You know, a movement whose goal is to eliminate or reduce the rule of power is just not as appealing to people who were power seekers. Um, one one issue that you brought up, which is the, the issue of, the, of discipline, that Marxist movements tend to be big on organization, discipline, the party line, democratic centralism, things of that nature. 
uh, it's obviously difficult for people who identify with libertarianism and anarchism to follow that kind of approach because they tend to have an anti-authoritarian value system which tends to mitigate against making that feasible. I think that's one problem. Um, in the case of the alt-right, um, the alt-right uh, again differs considerably from both anarchism and libertarianism in the sense that it doesn't really have this kind of anti-authoritarian undercurrent to it or anti-disciplinarian or anti-organizational uh, undercurrent to it. Uh, it. It tends to go in the other direction. It tends to you know, glorify authority or authoritarianism and things of that nature. Um, but it, as I said earlier, it does so in a way that is very unappealing to most people. You know, it doesn't offer some kind of vision of a future utopian world where poverty has been eliminated. If anything, it offers a vision of a dystopia, you know, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, something that resembles the Third Reich, or, or you know, at least that's how people perceive it. Um, I think that's one problem. The, the vision is just not sellable to a lot of people. Um, also, I think that a real problem the alt-right had is it ha has had is leadership and organization. You know, what I have seen happen among the alt-right is that the alt-right has never really been able to emerge as any kind of organized group that is particularly effective at achieving any actual goals other than getting into skirmishes on the street and things like that. Um, and along with that, I think, is, is leadership. Uh, you know, even among the alt-right people, um, among people in the alt-right milieu, I hear complaints about that. But, you know, we need better leadership. We need better organization. And um, as, as to why that has become a problem for that milieu, I, I think, again, it, it stems from the fact that so many people are drawn to it simply for its transgressive nature. And when you have a lot of people in a group who are simply motivated by being transgressive, it's very hard to flip that around and have a, a movement that is oriented towards organization and efficiency and discipline and and uh, culling out the, the weaker elements and, and uh, having this, the better leaders uh, in charge and things of that nature. I don't really see that happening in the alt-right. So it's you know it's a combination of ideas and organizations that are lacking in all of these groups. I would agree. I think also though, while on the surface anarchists and libertarians do have a very strong anti-authoritarian streak, I think it has more to do with the name you give the authority. For instance, anarchists will criticize libertarians for, as Chomsky says, accepting the total tyranny of the corporation, and. In many ways, libertarians will return the favor by saying that your worker collectives or unions or Soviet councils are going to be total tyranny as well. And it seems that they're more than willing to give up uh, individual autonomy to these perceived legitimate institutions. I think that the alt-right being a sort of racialist system, I think that's more in common with Marxism and since it is not overtly anti-authoritarian. Um, and that it does, I think, seek some sort of political domination. And I think that they might have a, a better chance, at least from the ideology point of view, uh, than the other two aforementioned groups. Because nationalism is, is, is a very powerful ideology that has motivated many revolutions and, and many governments. So it's quite possible that if they, if they could get their act together as far as leadership and organization, it, it might be possible for that to happen. Um, but I think another thing that, that this gets to is with the, the, the broad mass of the people. In his 1998 work um, or essay, Ralph Peters uh, writes, secular and religious revolutionaries in our century have made the identical mistake, imagining that the workers of the world or the faithful just want to go home at night to study Marx or the Quran. While Joe Sixpack, Ivan Tipnichi, and Ali Quat would rather watch Baywatch. And this is from Constant Conflict. And I think he hit he hit something important here, right? Most people aren't going to go home and then, you know, read these arcane intellectual justifications for these worldviews, um, either because they, they've got their own concerns or cares or uh, because of their uh, sort of bourgeois decadence. I think this is one of the critiques that, that Marx brings out that sort of hampers all uh, – resistance uh, movements today in the West is that, you know, life is fairly comfortable. I mean, you know, most people aren't living in grinding poverty. Most people aren't starving. Most people aren't, you know, being brutally oppressed by some sort of secret police or dictator in the West. And as long as that 
comfortable enough aspect is maintained, people are largely satisfied. And his um, work on the Protestant work ethic, Oswald Spengler points out that incentives can be a weird thing. Um, he mentions it in this one Bavarian farmer that wanted to encourage people to bring in the crops uh, early before the, the uh, a predicted hailstorm comes. He increased their wages. But what instead they did of working more hours, they worked less hours because the amount of income that they were accustomed to could be achieved with fewer hours. And so they didn't work any longer hours. So was, the incentive was backwards. And so a lot, a lot of these people, they have these sort of comfortable life. And until uh, it's, it's seen to be unworkable, you know, there's some inconveniences here and there. But until it gets really unworkable, you know, they're going to be happy about that. So it's a huge problem for these groups to overcome. Um, now, there are, um, there are demographics that are more put upon than others, and they might be more um, obvious choices for potential recruiting. But again, it's, it's trying to relate to normal people. Like, like if the alt-right, instead of wearing, waving swastikas in order to encourage white support, were to instead have pictures of Norman Rockwell paintings and, you know, the sort of like suburban white American families that we see from the 1950s, like Leave it to Beaver, that's going to have a lot more of a, a comforting and persuasive attitude towards people. And if like the libertarians maybe had a more of a classic Americana little guy, you know, working in the factory, becoming, you know, then becoming his own boss, pulling himself up by his own bootstraps, rather than going on and on about, you know, taxation is theft. A lot of people just don't relate to that. But they do relate to the underdog, you know, who pulls himself up by his own bootstraps. So I think a large part of it is also, I think, marketing. They, they just need to market themselves better. And they, they don't seem to be able to do that. What do you think? Well, in the case of the alt-right, um, the, the major problem that I see there is that increasingly the kind of value system that they espouse is just so far removed from the mainstream society that I, I think that it's not going to have any kind of audience beyond um, you know, fairly marginal um, points of view of fairly marginal people. Um, now, I, when I have discussed this with all right people, they'll say, oh, but what about classical fascism? You know, what about Mussolini and all of that? Um, they'll point out how, you know, even in when modernity was well established that, uh, you know, in the 20th century that uh, you had these fascist revolutions in, in certain nations and things like that. And to which I would say that a problem with that is the same one that the Marxists have. Um, it, there was never a Marxist revolution in an advanced industrial society, um, contrary to what Marx himself predicted. Uh, every Marxist revolution happened in what were basically backward peasant societies. Um, no advanced industrial capitalist society ever experienced a Marxist revolution. In fact, even Che Guevara himself said that. Che Guevara said that there had never been a, a communist revolution in a society that was even democratic in, in, the, in such a way that the democratic system was perceived as being legitimate and, and fair and things like that. Um, that's one issue. And the you know, all of the fascist revolutions or quasi-fascist movements or something similar to fascist, fascism that became popular um, happened in countries that had um, uh, that, that did not have a, a long-standing democratic tradition in the same way that most, certainly most modern Western countries do. Uh, in Germany, for example, Germany had only been a democracy for 14 years when the, the Nazi revolution took place. Uh, Italy still had a king, it was still a, largely a monarchy when the Mussolini revolution happened. Uh, certainly when you look at movements that were, you know, that are considered fascist or similar to fascism or whatever, like Franco and Salazar and all of that kind of, Juan Peron, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, none of those movements ever developed in the more advanced industrial democracies. Um, so when you have a movement like the alt-right that comes along and says that they don't believe in democracy in the modern sense, they... You know, they're skeptical of capitalism. They, they think that pre-modern societies were actually better, that modernity has been a degeneration, um, that fascism and maybe even national socialism weren't as bad as people say they are. Uh, again, that's really so far removed from the conventional 
a norm of the conventional ideology that it's it's very difficult to uh, find anything more than a very marginal appeal for that kind of thing. I mean, it's almost on the level of, uh, say, a group like NAMLA, the, the, you know, the, the pro-pedophile group or something. I'm not saying all right people are pedophiles, but, um, but it, in terms of just the social unacceptability or unpopularity or just seemingly bizarre nature of the ideas, I think that's the real problem there is just the sellability or marketability of these ideas. Libertarianism uh, is more compatible well, certainly with American culture than I think the alt-right is, but although I, I don't know about libertarianism being that compatible with the culture of hardly any other society, I, I think in the sp English-speaking countries, libertarianism can could be uh, a potentially influential movement uh, because it fits well with the whole English liberal tradition that it comes out of and which has influenced nations like obviously the United States and, and to some degree Britain itself and 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 um, in Canada and Australia and countries like that. Um, so libertarianism is, in, is within this English classical liberal tradition, you know, idea of limited government, free market. Um, and I think in, in the United States, which is the only nation where libertarianism really has any kind of audience uh, beyond just very small, isolated groups and individuals, um, I could see libertarianism becoming influential. But at the same time, it, that also seems to be swimming against the tides in many ways, because we now live in an era of um, record high uh, disparities in terms of wealth, like the, the the wealth gap between the social classes is now the uh, largest it's been since before the Great Depression. Um, and when you have movements like mainstream libertarianism who come along and say, that's fine, that's no problem, that's how things ought to be, uh, you're essentially revisiting the same kinds of arguments that uh, thinkers like Herbert Spencer or William Graham Sumner made in the 19th century about the, about the class structures of the Industrial Revolution. You know, basically saying, you know, labor exploitation, no problem. You know, it is what it is. Uh, it'll it'll work itself out. Um, you know, whatever intellectual case could be made for that point of view, it, it's not a sellable point of view during a time when class relations are going backward. If we look at the um, maverick politicians that have become popular in recent times, you know, uh, the, the most obvious examples are Donald Trump and uh, Bernie Sanders. Both of them, in large part, built their popularity on appealing to some of these bread and butter issues. Uh, Bernie Sanders, obviously, in, in the sense of you know, positioning himself as a kind of resurrected uh, New Deal Democrat, and Trump as an economic nationalist who actually talked about trade policy and jobs and things like that. You know, for on the other hand, you notice that Rand Paul did nothing in the Republican primaries. Uh, in the same, you know, Trump and, and Sanders did very well in their respective primaries. Uh, Rand Paul did did very poorly in the primaries, uh, and I think that's the reason why. I think that 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 point of view that says, you know, corporations are wonderful and and inequality of wealth is fine, and you know, with that and the way that we. Uh, in poverty is through ending government regulations that undermine entrepreneurial opportunities for the poor, you know, whatever the, the benefits of that argument from an intellectual level, I just don't think that's a sellable argument, certainly not in this time period either. Uh, so I, I think, you know, both of those, the alt-right, certainly the alt-right and, and the libertarians as well are, uh, both of them are swimming against the historical tides. I mean, they're just not in, in tune with what people are increasingly thinking about during this time period. Uh, the anarchists, um, you know, I think have many of the same problems as the alt-right in the sense that, uh, you know, when people think of anarchism, not only, like I said earlier, do they think of chaos and bomb throwing and all that, but when the average person turns on the TV and they see on CNN or, or Fox or whatever, they see uh, an anarchist demonstration going on and it's these guys in masks carrying sticks and clubs and, and shields and smashing out windows and you know, throwing debris at people and setting off bombs in public, and things like that. Uh, very few people find that appealing. Most people think these people are probably either dangerous criminals that ought to be locked up or else just think they're, uh, you know, a bunch of troublemakers that, that nobody should want to bother with. Um, and I think that that's a real image problem for the anarchists. I, mean, I, don't, I don't see that kind of thinking becoming particularly popular either. Um, in fact, a lot of normal, you know, everyday people that that have, that I know personally who have seen all of these things, 
they don't even understand the distinction between the Antifa and the alt-right. I know a lot of people who've seen these street fights and, and riots and things like that on, on television or on the internet, and they, they're thinking, okay, now who is who? So they think the Antifa are Nazis, or they think the 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 alt-right are anarchists or something like that. Yeah, they don't even understand what all the different groups are about because they all seem the same. They're just all crazy people that, that create chaos in public. Um, uh, so none of that obviously is a very viable strategy. Um, as far as any kind of anarchism that could be influential in the future, I, there's a lot of different types of anarchism and libertarianism that are now moving towards ideas like what they call startup societies or intentional communities or intentional nations and or things that you know you have the the uh, the free cities and economic zones and and even seasteading on the more exotic level you know creating you know boats you know ships that function as de facto independent societies i see those kinds of ideas probably being more likely to be popular in the future than anything else, you know, rather than um, doing what a lot of the left anarchists do, which is either, you know, on one hand, they just take this very far left extremist line on political issues. Um, and on the other hand, they get into a lot of transgressive behavior. And like you were saying earlier, a lot of their demonstrations look more like Woodstock or something like that. They look like uh, just a bunch of people uh, making a mess in public, you know, vandalizing things and not cleaning up after themselves. And that, that's just not something that a lot of people are going to uh, be able to identify with. Yeah, exactly. I, I think one thing you brought up earlier, and this is an important problem, is is what is freedom even for people that, that view liberty and freedom as a as a value as a good maybe even the highest good the problem is you have conflicting views i mean a classic example of this is is seen with the um during the Obama administration with the man healthcare mandate to supply contraception and the um the christian companies that refuse to do so because we have two conflicts here right we have a conflict of freedom of religion where the government says that we should respect people's conscience. And then we have the other problem of, well, you know, everybody's guaranteed a minimum of X, and, and, and X in this case includes uh, health care services, which also include contraception. And so we have forms of freedom that, con that, that actually contradict one another. And so even if you value freedom as the highest good, you still have to juggle which kinds of freedom trump other kinds of freedom. Um, I mean, another example might be the anarcho-primitivist versus the anarcho-syndicalist. Uh, if you want to have a green primitivist society, well, bye-bye blue-collar coal jobs and vice versa. So you, you, have, you have this, too, as a problem, which, again, is back to what you pointed out, the lack of a unified vision. I think the libertarians at least theoretically come closest to a unified vision. But as we've seen with the thick, thin libertarian debate and – the libertarian left and C4SS and then the libertarian right with like Hoppe and then the centrist like um, block, it it still ends up breaking down. Um, and I think I think part of part of it is when um, there was an essay by um, Ed Fieser who, who who was criticizing I think at this point Rothbard and the libertarians that a kind of uh, he kind of a kind of a presumed neutrality. The, the idea that you know you could you could have everything under the sun tolerated by this polycentric legal system because he as he pointed out whenever people start to actually move beyond a vague utopian idea to a brass tax reality uh, what was once uh, you know sold as a sort of a neutralist utopia centrist utopia ends up becoming more or less right wing or more or less authoritarian depending on who's uh, giving you the description of this brass tax society at the moment. And that's a problem that I don't think has really been solved by these groups. And I think lastly, as far as pushing against the tide, um, I think you're right in a lot of your criticisms of libertarianism and the alt-right as far as uh, being not in the mainstream. But anarchists have a problem as well in the sense that the abolition of private property, in, which is you know what a lot of far anarchists still advocate for is a very unpopular position Mo most people i mean even if you make the proper qualifications and say that well by private property we don't mean your house people still are going to have a hard time understanding you know how, how are you going to have you know large factories that aren't privately owned how are you going to have you know all these other things I mean, that are not privately owned 
And, and the idea of just abolishing the state in and of itself, which has you know, been around for 5,000 years, is an extremely uphill battle. Uh, one might even argue that's more of an uphill battle for the libertarians and anarchists and the alt-right going against racial views. But nonetheless, I think that there are these very entrenched values that are, are hard for these groups to overcome or at least persuade people that they're not actually goods in themselves. Yeah, well, the anarchists, as you said, a major problem that they have is that they've never really been able to update their views to make them relevant to a contemporary society. Um, you know, I know when we did the interview with Shane Hunter, the ex-Antifa, who had been a, an anarcho-communist and an Antifa, he was talking about one of the reasons why these people spend so much effort attacking you know, what they perceive to be racism and sexism and things like that is because their other ideas like anarcho-communism and syndicalism and all that are just so remote and abstract to most people. They're, they're ten, they tend to be more otherworldly, utopian ideas. So in order to have something to rally around or take action around, they identify with these things that are more conventional. Uh, you know, for example, it doesn't sound strange to say you are against racism and sexism. You know, you sound more or less like a, a Democratic Party politician or maybe even some Republicans. Um, so, um, you know, there's nothing really unusual or going against the grain by, by making um, a, a, taking a position like that. Uh, again, you were talking about the, the property theories of abolition of private property and things like that that you find among anarchists. Yeah, I, I know my own life experience uh, has been that whenever people come across anarchists saying things like that, they automatically think of the Soviet Union and, and systems where all property is owned by the state, a completely nationalized economy and uh, you know, a very static, uh, you know, uh, stifling economy. And um, you know, people think, well, that's you know, why would anybody be for something like that? Now, you can make all the qualifications. You can say, well, when Proudhon said property is theft, you have to understand that in the context of a early 19th century uh, was essentially feudal society in France. But most people aren't historians, and most people just don't think in those kinds of abstractions. Um, you know, most people are interested in, well, what about the here and now, and and, and that's about it. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, as you were saying about the, the idea of liberty, not only is the idea of abolishing the state something that certainly goes against the grains of what most people are accustomed to, uh, that goes without saying, uh, but the fact that all of these uh, more conventional conflicts do find their way into libertarianism and anarchism, as you were pointing out, um, you know, it's interesting how libertarianism, which is supposed to be this movement that's about abolishing the government and everybody does their own thing, is, or, you know, libertarians now spend so much time fighting over, you know, whether or not to be a true libertarian, you have to also be a feminist or, you know, whether there's a, you know, whether a, a libertarian can have a conservative views about religion or even race or something like that and still be a, a genuine libertarian. Um, I, I see that all the time. You know, I belong to a lot of online forums and discussion groups and social media groups for libertarians. And I see that every day, that, that kind of stuff people are arguing about. They're saying, well, you know, all, all, all true libertarians are, are, uh, are you know, also committed to social justice and opposing discrimination and things like that. And then on the other end, you have the followers of, of Hans Hermann Hoppe who say, no, libertarianism is just about private property. And that means you can exclude anybody you want from your property and, and all these other things. Uh, and in, in some ways, you know, I, I, they really just are, are a microcosm of the wider society. Uh, you know, the, the conflicts that exist in the wider society also exist to some degree within, within these fringe groups. I even see that on the alt-right. Uh, among the alt-right, which is a group that is, you know, a tendency that's supposed to be so transgressive and, and anti-establishment, in that milieu, I see them arguing about gay rights, you know, whether gays should be allowed in the alt-right or whether a, an alt-right society should tolerate homosexuality or not. Uh, you know, I see arguments about religion in the uh, alt-right, you know, like is, is you know, is, uh, should the alt-right be pro-Christianity or anti-Christianity? Should the alt-right be ne neo-pagans and, you know, reclaim their Germanic heritage or whatever? Should the alt-right be uh, scientific rationalists and, and anti-clerical. Anti um, 
and that so that even even in that milieu, you you find these same kinds of issues. Um, and um, among anarchists, I, I see that you know I, I see memes uh, memes being distributed among anarchists uh, where you talk about they talk about on one hand how you know uh, an anarchist should be uh, you know certainly should be anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-religious, whatever. But then they'll go, turn around and glorify or deify a lot of indigenous cultures where you certainly find plenty of well what by conventional standards would be considered racism sexism and religion and homophobia or whatever um, so you end up having the same conflicts again you know it, it's it, it, it continues to play out once again uh, you know I, I saw that in the last election in the 2016 election among libertarians I saw libertarians who were for Donald Trump and thought well hey you know at least he's not Hillary Clinton we got to keep her out I also came across libertarians who uh, said no he's, he's the worst thing ever you know and, and even Hillary Clinton would be better than, than her than him um, uh, so you know I it's uh, it's this I, I think again it gets back to one thing that I said earlier and that these groups have never really found a way to set themselves apart from the mainstream society by identifying ideas of their own and make and making those ideas stick and then advancing those ideas um, you know usually when a new movement comes along that starts out on the fringes and breaks into the mainstream it's because they are addressing an issue that is of importance to a lot of people but the establishment in all its forms is not addressing and perhaps cannot address because there's too many vested interests attached to uh, the the status quo. Um, for example, um, I guess the labor movement from history was one, or the Vietnam War was one example. If you look at the war in Vietnam, uh, when the war in Vietnam started, you know it was a bipartisan uh, effort. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution was voted for unanimously in Congress. I think the whole House and everybody except two. Uh, people in the Senate voted for the, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Uh, the anti-war movement very much started out on the fringes, but because it was addressing an issue of concern to a lot of people, either young people uh, eligible for the draft or just people who thought that the war was a bad idea, that the war was not going in any, in any kind of positive direction, uh, that mushroomed into a large mass movement. Uh, and that's generally how movements become successful. They have to if the fringe movements, they have to find an issue that the establishment, for whatever reason, won't or can't address, and then they capitalize on that issue, and that propels them into the mainstream and develops a, a uh, an audience for themselves. And these groups, uh, the anarchists, the libertarians, the uh, alt right, none of them have really done that. You know, I, I don't know that you know ethno states are something that that not many Americans really just care that much about are going to be that motivated by or, or abolishing the government or uh, or uh, you know workers councils and, and anarcho-communist communes you know those are just not things that you know, all three of those I, I, sets of ideas to most people sound like science fiction or something like that I mean they sound really strange and uh, it's it's certainly nothing that people are motivated by because they don't think it's something that's relevant to their own day-to-day -day lives. You know, they don't see this any of this stuff helping them get a job or pay the bills or feed their kids or you know, and they don't really see it as benefiting their own primary reference groups either. You know, their own community, family, you know, church, you know, even their ethnic group or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we're about out of time. Is there anything you'd want to leave us with, Keith? Uh, well, I think all fringe movements have this problem. It's not just the three that we've talked about, the, the anarchists, libertarians, and alt-right. Uh, you know, I, I think, for example, these neo-communist groups that are coming along now, you know, like it's becoming increasingly popular for people on the far left, you know, SJW types and Antifa types to identify as communists and wear a Che Guevara t-shirt or a Mao t-shirt. You know, I, I see them having the same problem. Um, the transhumanists and, and some of these other groups have the same problem. Uh, the primitivists have, have the same issue. I mean, the bottom line is nobody wants to give up the benefits of industrial civil civilization. That's just not going to happen. It's a it's a non-starter. Uh, you know, there might be people that want to you know live off the grid and things like that as a lifestyle that they choose for themselves, but it's not going to be a movement per se. Um, you know, unless it's forced by necessity, like technological breakdown or economic collapse or something. Um, there's a 
uh, you know, and, and I think that's true of fringe movements generally. I, I The one thing about the kind of society that we live in is that most people in a society, in a, you know, in a 21st century Western industrial democracy, just don't have it bad enough in life that they are going to go off and join fringe movements that promise to eradicate the, the world as we know it and create some new kind of utopia, however they envision it. People just don't see life as being that bad. Uh, you know, to the degree that they have problems that they want solved, you know, they, they want their help with their student loan debt. They want help with their, uh, their mortgage payments. Uh, you know, they want their taxes lowered. Uh, they want unemployment rates reduced. Uh, you know, depending on where they live or what the circumstances are, they might be concerned about this or that industry and how that impacts jobs, or they may be some favorite issue they have that they think is important for moral or philosophical reasons, you know, uh, abortion, animal rights, um, you know, something like that. Um, but they're, they don't really find ideas that promise to sweep away the old order and create some new utopia to be uh, appealing because they just don't see the world as it is to be that bad. Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks for coming on again, Keith. This is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast, signing off.